Nature's Apprentices, The Magic of the Peatlands, written by Elizabeth Bacoli, illustrated by Jennifer Lynn Becker, read by Elizabeth Bacoli, starting on page 41. What seemed like hours went by, each minute offering something new and exciting. Now and then, Marty would think about his mom and miss her, but then he'd be invited to join another dance or play another game. Then Aishna, who had been enjoying the fun as much as anyone, noticed something in the air change. Her translucent wings twitched, then shuddered. Aishna started to shake. An anxious dragonfly is hard to miss. What's wrong? Marty asked, just as his nose detected the slight scent of smoke. Johnny was playing his tenth game of hide-and-go-seek with the fireflies, when he noticed it too. In all the excitement of their return, he'd forgotten that dark plume on the horizon. Filled with guilt, Johnny flew surfed high over the trees. In the distance, flames flashed through silhouetted tree trunks, and a thick black column of smoke towered above the forest. We have to tell Rose, he yelled to Sir Fid, then found her in the middle of the fairy circle. Johnny jumped off of Sir Fid and ran toward her. Rose, I saw smoke when we were out with Horace, but it seemed so small and far away. Now it's a fire and it's getting close. His words were urgent. I should have told you sooner. Rose reached for Johnny's hand. She was calm. There's no time to feel guilty. We must prepare. It is close. I've been watching. But this fire is not one of ours, she told him. Then she looked up at the sky and spoke words Johnny couldn't understand. What do we do? How do we keep everyone safe? Johnny asked. He was frantic to help. But again, Rose was unruffled. The beings of the forest live with fire. We have for thousands of years. The muskeg is the safest place for all. It always has been and always will be. We must stay calm. It will be all right, she assured him. Animals had begun to move swiftly through the fairy circle, bringing the party to an abrupt end. Things changed quickly as the fire burned hotter and more fiercely. Soon flames licked the lichen-filled lower branches of the black spruce trees, then flared brightly in the treetops where spruce cones ignited and exploded in all directions, sending out sparks that started new fires. The deer, moose, fox, bear, all the animals of the forest ran for the fairy circle in the open air of the bog. Help! Marty called out in fear. He and Aishna were doing their best to avoid being crushed by the stampede of wildlife. Johnny heard his brother's call, and he made to leave at once. Stay here, Rose ordered. Johnny flinched. He had never seen her so serious or heard her tone so severe. We must stay calm, she repeated. Rose stood and closed her eyes. She began to spin slowly. As she did, the waters of the bog began to rise, forming a wall of moving water around everyone inside the fairy circle. The panicked rushing stopped, and the creatures began to settle as a protective dome of water took shape around them. Marty, Willow, and their guides flew to Johnny's side. They huddled together, scanning the faces of forest creature and fairy alike. All were peaceful and protected. There was magic in the muskeg. The moose lay down beside the wolf. The great gray owl perched on the moose's antlers. The fox and hare sat together. The mice and voles at their feet. The deer rested nearby, a fisher draped across her back. The lynx curled up beside the muskrat. The ravens and coyotes played a game of, with pebbles like nothing was out of the ordinary. Butterflies and dragonflies covered it all in color. This is beautiful, Marty said in awe. Someone's missing, said Willow. Hey, has anyone seen Mama Caribou and her calf? Everyone looked around. They aren't here, Willow, Johnny said quietly. They need our help, Willow leapt onto a firefly and darted for the top of the watery dome, where there was still a tiny opening. Willow, where are you going? Wait, Johnny called out as he and Sir Fid raced to catch up. Willow and Johnny flew out of the dome and high above the fire, searching for the caribou and her newborn. Far in the distance, 
the dry peat mine was engulfed by a blaze. Hovering on their insects, the children watched in horror as the vacuum machine caught fire and exploded. The fire streamed out in all directions, racing across the upland forests. Willow and Johnny scanned the trees below. Soon they saw them, a caribou and calf trying to make their way toward the circle. But the calf couldn't yet walk very quickly, and Mama wasn't going to leave him on his own. The children dove between sparks and burning spruce cone blasts. They communicated a risky plan to their guides, having no idea if it would work. All they knew was that they had to try. Willow closed her eyes and imagined Rose and Horace, sending out a message as loud as she could. Make me big again. Make us big again in five, four, three, two, now. Both children jumped from their guides in a leap of faith, growing to their human size in mid-air. They landed on soft moss, rolled, and ran toward Mama Caribou, who was startled by their sudden appearance. Sparks were landing all around them. Willow looked deeply into the caribou's scared eyes. Everything's going to be all right, she said. She picked up the calf, and she and Johnny escorted Mama to the fairy circle, bright sparks flying all around them. In the bog, they walked through the wall of water and collapsed on the other side, exhausted. As soon as Horace saw them, Marty grew, grew to his human size, too. Together, the three children sat among the animals, waiting for the fire to pass over and around them. The caribou fell asleep in Willow's lap, and Willow fell asleep against, leaning against Mama Caribou. Johnny fell asleep leaning against a baby bear, and Marty fell asleep leaning against Johnny. Now that everyone was calm, safe, and resting, Rose and Horace met in the center of the circle enshrouded by a magical mist for privacy. That was not part of the plan, Horace told her. I never meant for them to be in real danger. I know. It is also unpredictable. The bog is more at risk than ever before. Everything is drying out. I feel for these children. We are expecting too much of them, Rose replied. But did you not see the courage and determination they just showed? They'll be able to do it, Horace insisted. They shouldn't have to, Rose retorted. They are children. They should be free of worries like these. A tear glistened in her eye. Fairies don't cry very often. Their tears hold so much power that losing them can reduce their lifespan by up to a century. So Horace moved quickly, cupped his hand, and caught his friend's tear. Rose looked at him, surprised. He carried it to a nearby mushroom and gently poured it onto the spongy cap. White light, light traveled down through the mushroom and the ground beneath it began, began to glow. The sacrifice of 100 years, a fairy's tear, was not taken lightly by the spirits of the forest. Magic whispered all around them as the gift was given. Time would turn back, just a little. A mere day in exchange for one hundred of Rose's years, and Rose willingly paid. She wasn't the first fairy to give her life for the forest, and she wouldn't be the last. Horace and Rose flew on Diddy back to the children. There was one more lesson to share. Rose touched each forehead gently, bringing them all into the same dream as they slept. In the dream, the children and their guides flew over the burned peat mine. All that remained was a deep pit of ash, the fire having burned so fiercely there was no peat left to mine and haul away, no habitat left for the caribou, no medicines left for Willow's grandmother to harvest, and the carbon stored there for thousands of years had all been released into the atmosphere. No one would benefit from the peatlands now. When she had finished, Rose looked away, her heart heavy. Let's let them rest a bit longer, Horace said, as they flew high above the muskeg to watch time rewind. Thank you for listening. I really hope you enjoyed that part of the story. And now I have some writing prompts for you. The first writing focus is, if you could shrink down to any size, what animal would you want as your guide and why? 
Writing focus two. How do you think the draining of the Muskeg wetlands impacts the boreal forests and the people who live there? <laughs>